Hello ladies and gentlemen, Code Roger here. Welcome back to BeamNG Drive on the Automation Test Track. Today we're going to be once again looking at some one-hour build-off cars. Last week's competition was an MPG Racer competition. This was one that has been suggested to me multiple times and I think was a it was a particularly popular idea and it's obviously um, let's say fashionable right now to be thinking about you know maxing out MPGs and then also maxing out a car's performance potential so it was an interesting one the cars had to be 40 miles per gallon or more they couldn't use racing slicks and they had to be year 2020 so we were building you know basically a current model car those were primarily your only restrictions which led to a lot of creativity and honestly one of the the biggest spreads in time and one of the most unique selection of vehicles however i have to start with vario because i goofed somehow i went through testing all the cars and didn't test vario's car I feel terrible. So before we do anything else today, I am going to do the hot laps in this car to see how it should have done in the competition. Okay, so let me first ESC off. Let me find out. Okay, this is a dual clutch car. Got it. And let's uh, get to it, I guess. All right, so unfortunately, or maybe fortunately for you, this isn't being done at the same time as all the other cars, so I may be more or less fresh to the track now versus then. However, honestly, I think I am probably more tuned into driving now than I was then. Oh, understeer. Oh, understeer. Okay, okay. Is this thing front-wheel drive? I am not too sure. I am not too sure. It may be all-wheel drive, but it actually has a lot of front-wheel drive tendencies, so it may just be a front-biased all-wheel drive system. Not sure. Not sure yet. Pretty good speed here. I think if we're hitting in the, with the 130s, we're looking at a real stout competitor. And it looks like this car is going to be well into that territory. So I think if I can rein in the understeer, we may indeed have a pretty fast time here. It was interesting because there was just a very wide swath of times. There was there was times that were faster than a lot of the cars we built previously, and then there was a group of times kind of in the middle, and then there was some times... Ooh, brakes are an issue with this car. Uh, trailing at the end uh, for some cars that were built more primarily for efficiency but more than anything it was just the amount of different takes on this that was fun uh there was so many unique builds so many cars that were completely different from all the rest and that's what makes these one hour build offs so much fun especially in categories like this moving forward i think at least for this week's and maybe the next couple weeks we're going to be doing some not quite as race car-y of builds and trying to focus more on kind of real car building and then push those real cars to their limits. Yeah, he's in the brakes, you can see they're actually smoking there, so only so much I can get out of it there. But still, that's, um, that is a quick time for a first lap considering the issues. All right, well, let's see. Break a little early there and see what I can do. Okay, the brakes get hot, but they are still effectively working. The thing really digs out of the turns. It must be all-wheel drive, considering the fact that we are not using stability control or traction control right now. That's a lot better. Yeah, this this indeed was a a stout competitor. See, we got the, the fuel range thing going down there. Unfortunately, that app is not working exactly right. It's supposed to be giving me average miles per gallon, and it is most certainly giving me something much more in line with instant. It's a bit more 
right down here about the brakes, but I did manage to get it slowed down using the engine. And then, of course, the brakes will be an issue again down here. So we're going to brake probably before the 100 to make sure we can get the thing woed up. Do indeed. Very fast through there. Still improving over that first lap time, so this is going to be a very fast car around the automation test track. With a little bit better brakes and perhaps something to deal with a bit of the understeer, this would be uh, very much so one of the fastest cars I've ever driven around this track. Which is so incredible considering this is a 40 mile per gallon vehicle according to automation. 2038. I gotta go look, because I, I think that's miles and miles ahead of most of the rest. Oh yeah, a 2038 is three seconds faster than the fastest car that we tested. What? <laughs> What a absolute crime of me to have not tested this car on the day, but uh, still very impressive. Now, I did this during the stream, but I will do this now here as well. I'm going to go into automation and double check. We're, we're just going to look at the, you know, overall build and make sure everything's good. And more than anything, I just really want to see how you did this. So here we are in automation, now looking at the Vario, and this thing... Well, the Vario. Vario's entry. Pretty unbelievable. I'm, I'm super shocked, for one thing, that this is a naturally aspirated car. Most of our best cars, and actually most of the cars for this competition, ended up being turbo because it's easier to get better fuel economy out of the turbo cars. This thing, with its naturally aspirated 3.1 liter V8, an engine... You know, that's just like lusting after my heart, manages 41 miles per gallon. Pretty unbelievable. Pretty, pretty crazy. It does it with uh, a decent amount of overdrive, sure, and for sure some tricks and and different ways to to achieve that. But it manages 41 miles per gallon while still managing a 101 in track definitely blown away by this design it's it's really really incredible 60 percent front 40 percent rear weight balance i think i could feel that and i think that was actually one of the things maybe working against us and um could definitely feel that brake size look at those rotors in comparison to the wheels very very small brakes for the size of car that this is probably one of the biggest holdups for it. One of the biggest um, hang-ups. Oh my, look at that. Look at that. 18-inch wheels, 235 millimeter brakes. Those are very, very tiny. Now I realize the brake load is good. However, brake load isn't everything. You, you do want to have to look into how much heat those rotors can shed. And the smaller the rotor the worse that rotor is at shedding heat. So that's something to keep in mind. And I, I honestly don't think automation does a very good job of informing you of such a problem. Maybe the braking tests need to be a little bit more severe or extreme to show you this because maybe in regular road driving conditions that wouldn't be an issue. But for a car that scores in track, those brakes were not track ready. Just something to, something to think about as we move forward uh, this one, this one was pretty cool. So what I'm going to do today to give our star pupils a little bit more time to shine is run them up the short course of the Pikes Peak to see how they handled the, the hills, the tight turns, all of those, all of those max engine load situations. And what I've got going is a trip computer and a fuel usage calculator. Now, it, it shows an average miles per gallon on that, but don't pay any attention to that. That shows uh, very much so the wrong thing, like I mentioned earlier. But we're going to see, giving these cars the full beans, trying to get up to the finish line as quickly as possible, just how much fuel they end up using. Not really scientific by any means, but I thought it would be fun and interesting 
And let's see if it is that. And away we go. Uh, yeah, I think I'll use the manual mode on this car. Alright, Pike's Peak. It's been a minute since I've run up the peak here. But we have done this quite a few times as it's been part of our part of our competitions in the past. Okay, I apologize for any shaky wheel sounds. There's nothing I can really do about it. I've tried to put in a little bit more smoothing to the force feedback to to keep them at a minimum, but they're gonna be there, I think. So now that we know a little bit more about this car, super stable, very, very stable around these twisty roads even. But we do know that the brakes are going to be an issue. Pike's Peak is much harder on brakes, even going uphill, than was the automation test track. The automation test track ends up being hard on brakes. Oh, a little bit wide into the dirt there. Uh, ends up being hard on the brakes eventually, but it's not initially. It's a couple laps into it that things really start to, uh, to heat up. So far, so good, but we're getting to the more technical section now. Alright. Let's break nice and early for this one. A little too early. I'm just a bit... a bit scared of them, to be honest. The last thing I want to do is go flying off or into a guardrail. Turns out that ends up being the goal for most people as we're going up Pikes Peak, believe it or not. I'm trying not to let it rev too far out. I don't want to get the thing too far out of its peak power band still very incredible how much power and how even of power this thing makes given its naturally aspirated power delivery. This thing's using every bit of available tech in a naturally aspirated motor to make power and then it makes use of a very good all-wheel drive system and a pretty darn good suspension setup to um, really be a monster. Not just for the 40 mile per gallon challenge, this is one of the best cars I have driven in BMNG from automation. Ooh, understeer right there at the end, but we made it across the line. Alright, I will track how much fuel that used, but it did it in a 243, and as I suspected, one of the fastest cars I've ever driven up Pikes Peak there. At a 243, 343. And then of course there was... My car, which actually did pretty well this week, which I was impressed by. Uh, I spent a lot of time on the looks of my car because I was trying to, I was trying to build something based off of a real concept car, the Nissan, Nissan, the Nissan IDX. However, it ended up being a pretty darn good car build too, at only 197 horsepower, a lot less than some of our other competitors. That it used a 1.3. It used a 1.3 liter inline six turbo to get there, and uh, it just ended up being a really fun car to drive, to build, to look at. I think it looks really good in BMNG, especially, and using a front engine rear wheel drive setup, uh, I really do think it ended up being one of the most fun, and also probably one of the most maybe production ready ish cars towards the top of the leaderboards, but nowhere near the other cars at the top of the leaderboard. I was I was more than five seconds slower than the fastest cars. Um, but I was happy to have something that was near the top and ended up being a really fun one to build in and to drive. I'm super happy with how my car turned out visually. Uh, it looks awesome, and I hope it's going to be a lot of fun to drive up oh, Pikes Peak here. Pikes Peak? <laughs> Pikes Peak. Oh, Pike. Always peeing. Uh... <laughs> No, yeah, it should be a lot of fun to drive up Pikes Peak. Okay, I'm gonna leave ESC on. Oh, maybe I shouldn't. I mean, watching that boost, this level is pretty hard on the computer, but it looks like frames are holding fine. And if the frames hold above 30, then the boost holds fine. Hello, oversteer. 
Now this this sim here, BMG, does model the effects of elevation, so it isn't impossible that with cars like these you would potentially actually see some power loss by the top of the hill. I'm curious if the uh, oh hello <laughs> if the NA cars or the turbo cars handle that better in game that is certainly can tell there is a significant difference in the power of, of this car versus the one we were just driving. Brakes, however, I think other than the fact that it's rear wheel drive and that means that it it doesn't quite get out of the turns quite as well, uh, the brakes were very good and the overall balance of my car I thought was great. A little bit oversteery, especially for this kind of, of road. I think it was maybe a bit better suited to uh, the racetrack than this. But actually pretty fun, even with ESC on, which is kind of <laughs> canceling out the fun. But I want to make sure that I can I can do these runs in one go. Oh wow, yeah, the brakes are so good that I'm I'm being too easy on it. Okay. I'm curious to see if this car ends up being better on fuel than the others for making so little horsepower, or, well, little horsepower. 200 is not bad for a 40 mile per gallon car. However, it's nowhere near the level of the cars that ended up beating it. Which I'll be curious to see if it's better miles per gallon or worse than, than those cars. Ooh, hello! This, this thing was fun. I thought it would be. And it is. That's probably something that's a problem for me with these one-hour builds, is I really do always kind of focus on building fun cars. I don't I don't always just want to make something that's the best. I want it to be the best driving, too. Not as fast, for sure. Not slow. Not the slowest car I've ever driven up by feet. But not as fast. But really, really fun. <laughs> wow. Look at the difference. 243 to a 259. That's staggering. That is... That is... That's a lot of time. So you remember how I said there was a lot of variety in the cars this week? Well, here you go. This was the previous best time. Ling had a 206.6 and did that with a 2 liter inline 5 turbocharged car. Uh, this one was purely front wheel drive, very, very lightweight at 2100 pounds, and extremely powerful at 369 horsepower. Still managing, though, to get 40 miles per gallon. Pretty, pretty insane, I would say. This one was definitely a surprise once it hit the track. And now for something very different once again. Ling's front wheel drive monster. This one, this one should be rather speedy and quite a hoot. Okay, I still don't really know the best way to launch these DSG cars, so I just kind of rev it up and then drop it in a drive. Let me put it in sport mode for now. Because I have a feeling that this car is going to be a bit of a handful going up the peak here, being just front-wheel drive and having so much power, if you get into those situations where the nose really pushes out and you understeer real bad, hey, brakes, 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 all right, let's go into manual now, I think I'll be able to better modulate the, the downshifts to help me brake. The car only has drums on the back, which is interesting. It's really not a huge downside because it's so light, it has so much front weight, uh, and being front wheel drive, you know, there's there's a lot going on to make it so that the front tires are, are the ones doing the work, and uh, boy, that would be hard on an engine. 
4,000 RPM on a 9,000 RPM red line and making 40 pounds of boost, yeah, that would be <laughs> that would be putting some stress to it. Yeah, but the front wheels are the, the ones doing the work here, so those drums in the back are just kind of honestly along for the ride. Struggles to get power down out of the turns and with an engine that makes this kind of power and boost numbers, modulating the power out of the turns to keep it off of ESC is next to impossible. But I'm trying. Trying my best. Yeah, it starts to get into that problem in the tighter hairpins where the front tires just have too much going on. Front wheel drive cars can be very competitive in the larger racetracks and, and sweeping roads. Doesn't tend to be a big drawback to them. Once you get into the twisties like this and the real tight hairpins at Pikes Peak, that's where the front wheel drive is gonna be a drawback. This car Oh, actually, did kind of run out of front brakes there on me. Uh, but this car, of course, was built for the automation test track, so perhaps if it was known that it would be up here, there would have been different des design decisions made. But it is nice to kind of see the cars get pushed to a different limit. Still very, very fast. Oh, buddy! Hopefully some part of it made it across the line. 246. Five one one. That's happened to us a couple times where I've crashed into the end, uh, uh, the finish line thing. But we still got a time, so it's all good. I don't know that I'll be able to see the MPGs though. Eh, I'll be able to see it right before it happened. But if not, eh, we'll be fine. And then very different once again. This tiny little sports car, as close to a K car as we could really get in automation at the moment, or at least a. A uh, sports car, K car. This turbocharged inline four, making 240 nice horsepower. Definitely did things in a in a different way. Used all-wheel drive, uh, aluminum semi space frame, aluminum panels, everything to make this thing very high tech, low weight, and a, a real stout track car. This one was just a very track focused build that still managed to do. 42.6 miles per gallon. Pretty impressive there. And it's just so fun and so interesting to me how very different all of these builds ended up being. Also, McWeezy Face is a very funny engine name. Now, Mrs. Lore made a very cool looking car. And honestly, this is the K car that we that we so desperately wanted to build. And I'm really curious what this thing is going to drive like up the hill because I have a feeling it's going to be... Maybe surprisingly better at this than it was on the test track, but I don't know. I think maybe the turbo cars have a little bit of a disadvantage here. We'll see. There we go. But this one being all-wheel drive, ESC won't be working so hard. This one doesn't make quite as much boost either. This one makes a much more, I don't know, production reasonable amount of boost. So therefore it won't be... It won't be so um, long-winded to get spooled up, so maybe it won't be affected so much by the tight turns here. Brakes already feel mushy, though. Ooh, lots of understeer there. I didn't expect that. The turn-in is really nice, but then, like, mid-turn, it just feels like it doesn't have quite enough confidence in the front end. I love this view over the nose. I think this was a very, a very cool design. Maybe not 2020 ready, but I thought it was a cool look and uh, overall presentation. Nice. Oh yeah, this is this is gonna be a quick car. It's so precise. I guess is the word. You know, I almost feel like a, a magazine, you know, car reviewer now, <laughs> which is essentially where I want to be with this. This is, that's the reason I want these build-offs is so that I can have cars to review. I enjoy, I enjoy looking at people's different perspectives on how to, how to solve these problems. Yeah, it's not great too early. 
early for this one, but not too late either, because this thing doesn't seem like it has incredible brakes. A little bit wide there. The brakes are doing okay. As you can see, the rears are working a lot more on this car, and uh, we may end up cooking those rear drums by the end of this. Because they shed heat much slower than discs. I wonder what it was that enticed people to use the drums on these cars. Oh boy, we are already pretty far up the hill for 215 in. I think this is going to be a pretty quick time. It's just lacking a little bit of ultimate power, I think, to have one of the fastest times. Valero's car is absolutely astonishing, really. And I don't know that there's much they could touch those times, but this one is going to be pretty good. And certainly one of the best driving cars. Nice. Alright. 250.2 is a pretty good time. And it does it, it does it very tidy like and uh, but still fun you know it's hard to make a car that's controllable and tidy but is still fun to drive but that one that one does it I unfortunately can't show you this one in game because this particular car is built in the next version or a future version of automation so the fixtures are not working for me and there's a lot of stuff to do with this car that uh, has new game features that I can't see but Isaac did build us an interesting car with 291 horsepower, a magnesium 1.5 liter inline four. Again, kind of going for the the hot hatch style. However, this one ended up being a rear longitudinal rear wheel drive tiny hatch with 40-60 weight split that by all means should not have handled as well as it did. I'm very glad that I get to drive this one again because it was one of our top five fastest cars because we get to see the noodle exhaust. <laughs> so this car is built in a, in a future version of automation and it has some new fixture styles and has some new technologies in that they are doing completed exhaust systems. Uh, it does seem, however, there's some issues currently with the exporting in that we have some dangly bits. But we'll not worry about that. Let's see what Isaac's car drove like up the hill. This one again, floppy paddles. Decent getaway there. I don't remember exactly what this car drove like. I just remember that it's it's rear-engined, rear-wheel drive, and somehow managed to put in one of the best times on the track. It's certainly very powerful. It revs to the moon, 90, like 9700 RPM. See how darty it is, even with, even with traction control on. Okay, good brakes. It's very light. Oh, hello, wonder steer. Oh, jeez. Oh man, certainly, certainly an interesting driving car. I it. It definitely falls into the Widowmaker category <laughs> because it's just fast enough and gives you just enough confidence that when things go wrong, they go really wrong. And because of its weight balance, because of that rear engineness, uh, it also happens in a hurry. You know, they, they snap when they oversteer and they, they just dart around very. I don't want to say unpredictably, but just very fast. You gotta, you gotta stay on top of a car like this. Nice. <laughs> oh boy, you gotta work with this one. But I think it's actually. Oh, jeez. Easy, easy. I think it might still be one of the quickest cars, despite its murderous tendencies, it's still real fast. <laughs> and it manages to get out of the turns really well, thanks to that 
rear wheel drive rear engine in it, so it's got the weight over the rear wheels to keep them gripped, even if it doesn't have the all wheel drive to give it the power out of the turns. That's a pretty good time for this section. If I can manage to keep the thing on track. <laughs> <laughs> not quite. Not quite. Hey, that's part of the build-off. If you make a car that's too hard for me to drive, then you're not going to get the best time out of it, you know? Okay, okay. Easy now. <sighs> this one, uh, this one's a workout. But I think we made it. We only had one, we'll say, minor off. Am I even going to make it to the finish line? I will! 252-253. That one, uh... That one, that one makes you, you keep check of your heart rate. We'll, we'll word it that way. And last but not least, Miko with a heavily designed mini supercar that still manages to get 40 miles per gallon with a 2.2 liter Boxer 4, making 290 horsepower, as is the norm, as we are getting used to, Miko's car is, is exquisitely designed and impressive amounts of detail, and it's got boost <laughs> for a one hour build, really always going above and beyond in the design department for these these one hour build offs, and somehow still manages to make cars that perform very well. 46.8 miles per gallon, wow. Not only is this car really knocking out of the park with the mileage and everything, but look at it. It's like a perfect build. Every, everything's really good about this car. Scores 100.2 in track, super affordable. Yeah, it's just a good car. It's a really good car. All right, last trip of the hill. In this boxery goodness, let's see how it do. A very interesting view out the front of this one. <laughs> it's like <laughs> it's like our screen has a mustache. <laughs> All right, let's see here. What kind of gearbox do we have? This one's DSG, and I've basically sold it because of that. Oh, it does make noise. Okay, let me let me restart that real quick so that I can give this thing the revs that it needs and deserves. There we go. Okay, now this is with ESC on. We'll see if that's the right call or not. For a car that states, got boost. Actually, this one does not make a, a heinous amount of boost. <laughs> that was the word that came to mind there, I don't know why. But uh, yeah, we've had cars that certainly made more. Ooh, it's a little, it's a little skatey at the back. Pretty good brakes. A lot of dive, though. Now, a lot of the cars... <sighs> Come on. Come on. Yikes. Bit of a... Bit of a... Aggressive... Boost curve there, I think. Or maybe not boost curve, but... But it's got that, um... Real... Real bad turbo lag. It does not like to be at lower RPM. It does make me think that maybe... ESC off would be the way to go with this car. But it does have a little bit of that skatiness to the rear. Let's go down to first gear. Yeah, that's better. If we can keep the RPM up, that's better for it. I think I was making some other grand point. Oh yeah, about the the body roll. It's amazing to me how many of the best cars that we drive are the cars that have the ability to pitch and roll a little bit. And this is something that I argue with a lot, especially in the autocross community is people that are just so determined to get rid of any body roll in their cars. But it's actually really important that the suspension can move, that there's some play, some give in it. It has the ability to to um, actually use its suspension if it's not so ridiculously stiff. This car is doing that wonderfully. It's actually quite a treat to drive, despite the fact that I overran that turn a bit. The only thing that's really holding it back is that uh, power curve. Down in the, the low range, it's just struggles to, to get into the power. 
really gotta go into first gear, which means you you then run into traction issues because of the torque multiplication. Okay. A little bit dancy there, but it's, it's good. It's a good dancy. Come to first here. Get it turned in. Make sure we point that mustache to the apex. Brakes on this one. Really good brakes. Oh, shifted to the second a little early there. Did keep it in the in the power band though. Good driving car. Just needed a little bit more low end power. We'll be fine there. <laughs> I had a 255.667. Yeah, a, a good driving car. Maybe not as well suited for this as it was the big track though. I could see this car being being better suited for open roads. It'd probably be an amazing car out there and you know, tail of dragon kind of stuff, but Pike's Peak, maybe not its strong suit. All right, well now I've driven all the cars. I gotta do some tallying. I'm just kind of curious, whose car ended up using the least amount of fuel? I, I will be very surprised if it was the fastest cars. If, if the fastest cars ended up being the ones that were most efficient, that would, that would blow me away. Also, can we take just one second to recognize the fact that the fastest car we've ever gone up Pikes Peak with in this configuration did a 240? That's just phenomenal. So out of curiosity, I decided to take a look at our cars here's MPGs going up Pikes Peak. Of course, 40 miles per gallon in an MPG rating does not mean that a car will be very fuel efficient while you know giving it the beans up pike's peak but it is interesting to see the the grouping here so varios the fastest car did a 4.7 miles per gallon trip up the mountain and then laying a 4.8 uh i think the best yeah the best was messes lore at 7.6 miles per gallon and also one of the fastest cars on the automation test track and it was really quick up Pikes Peak as well, so uh, that one was the most fuel efficient. Mine was actually the second most fuel efficient at 7.4. You had uh, Isaac's there at 6.2 and Miko's at 6.0. I mean, those numbers are all bad, but that is full throttle, giving it everything I can to get up to the finish line as fast as possible. So those numbers aren't terrible. Uh, for comparison's sake, I ran some of our previous muscle cars up Pikes Peak, and those numbers were below one. <laughs> so, 7.6 miles per gallon, not that bad. Not that bad. And uh, I wish there was a better app in BeamNG for us to use for uh, comparison's sake. But unfortunately, doing the math like this is the easiest way to do that. But it might be something worth trying in the future. Now there is of course variance in that. A lot of that's going to come down to how I drive, how much, you know, throttle I'm giving it, if I'm using ESC or not. There's tons of different variables there, but we do this stuff for fun and it's fun to look at the numbers. I hope you all enjoyed and I hope you're looking forward to the next one hour build off. It'll be tonight at 6 p.m. We usually start the builds, 6 p.m. Eastern time. This week, we're going to be rolling with style. Hope to see you there.